basically the trauma-informed approach is going to be working with the whole person, making sure that we are using that holistic approach and we are ensuring that we cover the mental, the emotional, and the physical part. And that obviously brings the financial, the social, the living aspects, and so on. Just making sure that the person is healthy as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. When we're talking about the whole person approach, um, or the holistic approach uh, to client care and empowerment includes um, understanding the environment, the systems, um, the day-to-day -day life, the experiences of the client, and taking that into consideration as we put together plans and purposes and interventions to um, empower our populations and communities. I Absolutely. think that it, it begins in our advertising mm -hmm. and our engagement, our policies, um, how the, the environment or the property is set up. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a really interactive and, and you know, 360 degree approach. It's an right. action word, right. you know, it's participatory. Exactly. You know, and I like that. So we've got yeah. to take it a step further if we're really going to talk about whole person care. How do we help that individual heal, you know, as they go through that process? Absolutely. And NASDAQ maybe originally taught us the, the question, the shift in questions from what's wrong with you, which obviously sounds very judgmental when someone walks in and maybe, you know, is frustrated or angry about something, shifting from that question to what may have happened to you. Yeah. And we don't have to know all those details, of course, but just knowing that certainly a lot of our population, a lot of all of us have experienced some kind of trauma in our lives, mm -hmm. which impact may impact when we walk in the door. And so shifting that question and then shifting it to what's wrong with you. So it may be things that people had learned to overcome. We, people have overcome really hard things and mm -hmm. have learned skills. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those things may not serve them in the best way when they're entering our healthcare system, but having that awareness really helps us shift to what's strong with that person. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy that phrasing of what's strong with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the communities that we engage with in our work, they are used to clinical spaces that are cold, that are unwelcoming. And so our drop-in center is in a house. When you come through the door, it feels like your home. It's a living room setting, it's black queer artwork, it's banned books. Mm -hmm. The intent is for it to feel comfortable and feel like home. I think we need to take this really warm, mindful, aware approach and engaging people through the, the full process, you know, through the environment, through the paperwork, through the intervention. And quite frankly, I think we oftentimes forget, but also evaluation of the service. You know, clients Absolutely. should be involved in the evaluation of that the same day service and the overall experience, mm -hmm. you know. I would even go a step further. Actually employing the community is the closest and fastest way to get that whole person approach. Yeah. It's the fastest way to know, okay, this is what will get community active and engaged in our services. We have team members that span the spectrum of black and queerness. We have team members that are black and trans. We have team members that are black and non-binary. We have team members that show up to work and do direct services in drag. We also have team members that have tattoos, you know. What it shows community is I'm engaging in someone that I can identify with. I'm engaging with someone that is is of the community and I am I feel more comfortable I feel like I can you know open up a little bit more you know we can't make the sa the space safer but we can make it braver and part of making a space braver is letting community know I see you mm -hmm. I see you because I am you mm -hmm. Love that. I think that's so important and I probably one of the lessons we learned early on when we started doing this work. Oh wait, our patients aren't separate than our staff. We're all human beings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes our patients are our staff. Mm -hmm. And taking care of ourselves and trying to do that at the organizational level versus make sure you go home and take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we need to really do a lot more work to, to build in that wellness to our work environment. We have an agency that we work with, um, one of our subrecipients, and they are entirely peer-led. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that they come to the trauma-informed care program of, with asking questions about is, how do we take care of our staff that are doing this work? We have experienced everything they're coming in here and saying, we've gone through it. And some of that is re-traumatizing. Absolutely. Um, and it's, my experience is valuable as a peer, but also I'm valuable as a person, right? Like I still need to be taken care of. I still need things. Um, and so I just, I always wanna bring that piece into the conversation because I think we do a really good job of caring for community 
most of the time, right? We can always be better, but we don't always do such a great job of taking care of ourselves as we do this work. So When we're thinking about giving direct services to community, transportation is an obstacle mm -hmm. in care. And giving bus passes to community is like, well, thanks, but no thanks. You know, that, yes, that is helpful, but it's not going to, you know, that's not eliminating barriers to care. And so one of the things that we did when we opened our center was we started a transportation program where we're going to give you transportation to and from your doctor's appointments to make sure that you're able to get to that appointment. And we're gonna follow up and we're gonna say, okay, is transportation all that you need? You know, what else is stopping you from accessing care? Another barrier that often comes up for folks is, um, is food insecurity. So we make sure to give, um, we have both a, a food pantry at our agency as well as uh, Kroger cards for the grocery store. And so um, people are more likely to come to therapy when they have a ride there and a, and a full belly mm -hmm. and they're ready to engage in therapy. They're ready to engage in services, right? And so it is that checklist. It's like, what are the barriers? Let's start taking down the barriers and then we can offer the care. We can engage in the care, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think that us as providers, us as organizations and doing this work, we have to think expansively because community is looking at us. Mm -hmm. And if we're saying that, well, money's a barrier, then, you know, they're, they already know that money's a barrier. But if we're really leading with joy and we're leading with liberation, then we have to be the change that we want to see. Wow, well, that's I very agree. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, that's yeah. so important that we really look at those community partnerships mm -hmm. and that yeah. we don't like, think from this scarcity mindset, mm -hmm. but the perspective you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So in Virginia, we have a really expansive network of trauma-informed community networks, which has really been beneficial for me in setting up this uh, trauma-informed healing-centered approaches initiative that we have uh, at the at VDH. And one of the partnerships that we have is actually with uh, Dr. Cynthia and at Nova Salude. You all actually embody all of the principles of that trauma-informed and whole person-centered care that um, we, we've been talking about here today, right? And it's it's just amazing because we don't want to do it all, all by ourselves. No. We can't. We can't. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that is also because of the support and the uh, different ideas that we get from VDH. I think that the, the whole uh, idea of working together, collaborating with you, VDH, and other organizations is always picking up new ideas, new concepts, and making sure that we implement that as a, at the same time that we share what we're doing with others. So maybe there is something, like you mentioned, that can attract them and maybe they can implement that as well. As VDH, right, we're in a unique position of rolling this out across the state with the, our subrecipient agencies, the agencies that we fund. Um, and part of rolling that out is the agencies have to then give me feedback. Mm -hmm. Did we roll this out in a way that was trauma informed? How did you enjoy the trainings? How did you not enjoy the trainings? What can we change? Um, is there better ways that we can communicate with you all? Is there a different way that we can give you this training? And it gets back to the ne the need and the uh, necessity of having that collaboration. We can't do it all. Mm -hmm. One organization cannot do it all. Yeah. And to be humble enough to recognize that and say, well, this organization can, how do we connect you? And how do we keep that, not just create the momentum, but sustain the momentum of not just the training, but the practical demonstration mm -hmm. of what's occurring when that's outcomes and assessments that we're talking mm -hmm. about. When I think about the future of trauma-informed care and whole person, um, whole person approaches, I think about it being community-led. And I really think that when we're leaning into community, thinking more expansively about what is community and like, okay, well, who aren't we touching? Who aren't we seeing, but who are we serving? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is where, at those intersections is where we'll find the answer. Mm -hmm. I think about things can be better mm -hmm. in the future and that we have to believe that. We are, we are far from doing this perfectly right now and we may never be doing it perfectly and that's probably not a good concept to even strive for, but to have the hope that things can be better and we can keep doing this work and we can keep thinking creatively. 
And it's also about continuing having these type of conversations. The whole idea of this is not the beginning, this is not the end. This is just a conversation that leads to another one and another one that is going to help us learn a little bit more about what is going on and how we can help. Yeah.